Welcome back. The title of this mini lecture is American Industrialization, Part 1. Now, we're going to be talking about kind of the second industrial age in America, right? The first one happened in the first half of the 19th century, right? It's kind of the beginnings of it for the Americans. So, we. Okay, spoilers, America doesn't create industrialization. We're really good at it, obviously, but we don't create it. So we're going to talk about five terms that you should, in your readings, kind of key in on in order to get a better sense of the topic, because there's there's a lot there. It is, you know, it seems simple, but but we need to, you know, kind of understand this, I think, a little better. So first off, working class. All right, now, this is kind of a catch-all term. It's one that folks have a hard time sometimes describing. Right? They wonder, does uh, back, family background, uh, heredity, education, skill, what does skill mean? What does unskilled mean? Right, All of this thing. So by the time you get to the end of the 19th century, uh, many in America, primarily in industrial and mining and other kinds of these kinds of communities, are identifying themselves as being part of a similar class of individual, a community of individuals. Uh, and there were distinct traits that were associated with this within the public community and the kinds of work experiences and treatment that these individuals are in, enduring and understanding. And so things like cities and new suburbs and urbanization and progressive policy and work, you know, workplace relations, rise of unions, uh, backlash against unions, uh, worker uprisings and unrest, strikes, all of these kinds of things. Uh, popular culture, right? All these things are being shaped by these communities that are consciously considering themselves to be a part of a new industrialized working class in America. Uh, and again, this is late 19th century. So if you're looking for examples of cities where this would occur, right? Certainly Chicago, of course, uh, but, you know, other cities as well, such as modern Pittsburgh, uh, you know, would be another example. All right. Number two, antitrust, right? Antitrust. So, if you were an industrial baron uh, at the end of the 19th century, you might want to consolidate your corporate holdings, uh, and trusts were a way that that would be typically done. Now, the process of creating a trust, you know, once it had gotten to that point, right, uh, this kind of corporate conglomeration, uh, which would hold sway over large amounts of industry or industries, uh, you did get reformers, uh, really after the 1880s, uh, that start to argue that maybe trusts are not a good thing. And so you start to see uh, political actors push back against this and seek to be able to kind of break up or bust these trusts. Uh, and you see the passage of legislation to that effect. The Sherman Antitrust Act uh, would be a good example of this kind of legislation. Hint, hint. Uh, there's a Northern Securities Trust case uh, in the early 1900s as well uh, that would be a good example of this. Now, that case also brings us into our third point, Rockefeller and Standard Oil. So John D. Rockefeller is a prominent industrial figure in the second half of the 19th century. He's the leader of something called the Standard Oil Company, as well as a number of other industries all over the United States. What Standard Oil did particularly well outside of, you know, perhaps the, you know, mining for oil and all of that is coming to control the refining uh, industries in America so that by the time you get to the early 1900s, they dominate the overwhelming majority of it all over the country at the time that the automobile is becoming more affordable and a possibility for Americans. Uh, and this is really going to kind of transform things and he's going to become, you know, one of the, if not the richest man you know, in, in American history. Now, point number four, Knights of Labor and AFL. The second half of the 19th century is the time period in which both Americans uh, of, of all walks of life are going to find their way to factories, new factories, in new urban spaces across the country. Now, for many who are first-generation immigrants or perhaps second-generation or this kind of thing, Trying to find common cause uh, with many of their fellow employees would lead them into unions. Now, working associations had a history prior to this time, but in the 1860s, you're going to start to see the formation of what's called the Knights of Labor. And after something called the Haymarket Incident or Haymarket Riot in the 1880s, you're going to see the growth of a different union called the American Federation of Labor. 
Largely, unions are able to operate by organizing individuals either around a particular craft or trade or an industry overall, but that industrial union stuff, that's a little later. All right, this brings us to our, our fifth point, our final point, Haymarket. All right, so this area in Chicago is the scene of a riot and violence, uh, of workplace violence uh, in the 1880s, surrounding a May Day sort of event. Uh, where a bomb is thrown and a few individuals are killed, notably some police officers. And the thought was on the part of Chicago business leaders that, well, anarchists must be responsible because the 1870s, early 1880s is a time period not only of workplace organizing, but political radicalism, not only in the U.S., but in Europe as well, right? The Paris Commune would be a good example of this. Now, there's not a lot of direct evidence to actually connect anarchists uh, to what's going on at Haymarket, but eh, the business leaders don't really care. Uh, and eventually a number of these individuals are put on trial. Uh, some of them are, are, are killed. Others are eventually freed later. But Haymarket becomes a sort of cause celeb uh, for a number of political radicals all over the world. Uh, so those who are anarchists, say, in France in the 1890s are conscious of what happened at Haymarket. Thanks so much.